are here at Dodger Stadium for playoff baseball. Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Maria Soreo. Now, so much to get to in the show today, but let's start right here with our Los Angeles Dodgers, who have made it to the postseason. They won their division. They beat a very good team in the Washington Nationals and now take on another very good team in the Chicago Cubs. But because we like to take you behind the scenes here on Playing the Field, we're going to show you what it's like when you call your very last game here at Dodger Stadium as Vin Scully did and you clinch your division. Let's take a look. Oh my God. Best moment in, in my baseball career. You made a smile on your face when you were rounding the bases. What were you thinking? The game was over. position uh, to get a game winning hit for it to be a walk off homer. Um, not really sure if I deserve that, uh, but I couldn't have asked for it any better today. Um, again, these are some great teammates and baseball's fun. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fun day, you know, for Ben's last home game and for us to get to celebrate and at home for the last home game and just really this whole weekend, you know, it's been kind of a, it's been pretty historical, you know, and so for us to get to be a part of it, for myself personally to get to be a part of it and pitch yesterday and uh, get to speak on Friday, it's just, uh, it's just a special weekend. <laughs> Of course he does, you know, but uh, I, I think we should give all the credit to him. He's the one, you know, guiding the ship and uh, keeping us afloat and weathering the storms when, uh, you know, it looked like everything was going downhill and, and Clayton got hurt and, um, you know, we were eight games back and what were the Dodgers going to do? And, you know, he was the one that kept us upbeat and positive and, and kept pushing us forward and, uh, you know, definitely wouldn't be here today without him. You really and truly have been the wind beneath my wings. I owe you everything. Now, people say to me, well, now that you're retiring, what are you going to do? Well, you know, if you're 65 and you retire, you might have 20 years left of life or more, and you better have some plans. When you're 89 and they ask you what your plans are, I'm going to try to live. <laughs> I have a great wife whom I adore. I have five wonderful children. I have 16 grandchildren. And I have three I guarantee you, if I don't know what to do, they will find something for me to do. <laughs> And we will have much more on Vince Scully a little later in the show. But right now, it's time to talk about pitching, which has been very interesting this year at the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the man that knows more about it than practically anyone is Dodger pitching coach Rick Honeycutt. Let's take a look. All right, we are here with Dodger pitching coach Rick Honeycutt. Rick, this has been probably one of the craziest seasons. And, and for you, it has to be one of the most challenging with all of the changes. And yet, this team is in first place. How is this working? Well, I think it uh, sometimes, you know, just the uh, overall, I think the stability of, of the pretty much the everyday lineup. I think, you know, the key guys that have been able to uh, 
uh, put things together. Obviously, the second half, we're hitting the ball extremely well and, and starting to put some offense together, which is always a big help no matter who's on the mound. But, um, you know, from my standpoint, obviously, it has been challenging to have so many different starting pitchers, all the injuries that we've had to battle with, and, and nothing like we designed when we were leaving spring training. So um, that side of it, and you just, I think you, you stay with a philosophy that uh, we've kind of created is, is trying to, you know, still uh, put together, you know, as good a game plan as possible. And truth of the matter, though, the bullpen, is, for, for me, has been the lifesaver of our team. Um, all the innings that they've had to carry this year, uh, you just can't say enough about them. And, and I think that uh, they've really been the glue for, for, the, for the staff so far. Talking about the bullpen, everybody worries about the taxing of the bullpen, especially going into September. How do you sort of avoid that? Well, I mean, I think from night to night, obviously, there's people that are down and there's people that uh, uh, you're going to stay away from if at all possible. So, I mean, we do still do the best. We still <laughs> care about, you know, the number of innings and the number of appearances that they do. But at the same time, when you're... Um, when you have X number out there and uh, we have a situation where the starters um, unfortunately haven't gone deep, I mean, you're forced to forced to use people that you shouldn't be using on certain nights. So it, it has a, um, an ongoing effect that eventually uh, gets you. So, um, but at the same time, I mean, again, these guys have stepped up. They've been warriors, and I just can't say enough about them for their, uh, you know, tenacity and the way that they go about their business with um, people can't overlook that fact that uh, they've really, you know, been the glue to hold us together during, the, during these tough times with uh, uh, short, short outings from starters. And when we come back, the IndyCar season may be over, but not for one driver who's not done competing. He's now competing on the dance floor. Sound familiar? We'll be right back. Well, we are so excited to be here at Dodger Stadium this deep into October playing baseball. And as the Dodgers continue their journey, the Lakers and Clippers begin theirs at the Staples Center. I had a chance to catch up with both teams at Media Day. You know, without the ball moving and a lot of movement. The guys are going to like it. Uh, he knows uh, he's been, you know, a player you know, a long time ago. As he's been in a great team at like Golden State. I think people, uh, the guys are going to respect that. I think it's pretty clear, pretty uh, straightforward. Um, know what we have to do, and I think if we can figure out that how to put all that talent together and play play together. I think we can be a really good team. Do you think it's a plus for Luke that he was a Laker and he sort of knows the Laker philosophy? I think so, for sure. Uh, why not? I think everything counts, and everything you can put, you know, everything you can add to that always is going to be easier. Uh, he knows the facilities, the the people who work in the office that make everything a little bit more comfortable for him, for sure. Welcome back. Thank you. You know what? You guys have so many new players this year. What is it like for you? You're coming back for your second season to sort of gel with the new players and especially a lot of young players. Well, the, most of the young players, you know, they've been here last year. We got uh, Brendan and uh, Ivica, uh, which are uh, great kids, and you know, they 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 will adapt really fast to what Luke wants, and uh, they they they'll be uh, good pieces for us uh, for sure. Uh, I think Brendan's got tremendous potential. And uh, you know maybe he's he's still physically not not, not his best, but uh, he's one of those guys that he he's got amazing length. Uh, he's, he's he can shoot. He can play great defense. He's really skilled for his size. Um, uh, you know he he he's got like no limits if he wants. And uh, you know with all the new guys, like you said, they, it's just it's just interesting to have like a bunch of. Like veterans that been around and uh, been in winning teams, guys that you know uh, know what it takes to to win games as well. Uh, really uh, professionals as well, which which is important. Guys that are are uh, willing to do whatever it takes to to win games. So uh, really excited about this this new uh, this new group, uh, the new chemistry we're gonna have, the new identity, of course, especially with having uh, a new coaching staff, which is gonna make you know everything all different as well. So uh, I think we have a good, a good mix of uh, a young core and then uh, some other veterans that uh, 
will, will, will make it everything very interesting for us. My question. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. What's your take real quick on, on from our players this offseason? And, you know, obviously. It's been an honor to even play 19 years in the NBA. I've seen a lot of players come and go uh, faster than they probably should have. And uh, I've been fortunate to be in the game this long. And hopefully I can just share some of my experiences with the rest of my teammates. Uh, hopefully I can inspire them. Hopefully we can win a championship and I can, uh, you know, pretty much go on top, you know. So I, I like our chances. The reason for me coming back was because of this group. I think this is a good group. Unfortunately, we dealt with a lot of injuries. I think this group is talented enough to win a championship, and that's one of the main reasons I want to come back to give it one more try and help this group get over the top. If you can see him out in the doorway. Blake, straight ahead. Every team, on, every team in the league have talent, and just some have more than others, but... Like, like Paul is right, we got we got a good team, but I'm not gonna call no team in the league super teams. Main thing is go and push one another. It starts tomorrow, and it's gonna carry over to the rest of the season. So, whoever it may be, no matter what number, Luke, me, or Allen, whoever it is, that as long as we push one another, because it's only gonna benefit us. And just think, this will be the first time in 20 years that the Lakers will be without a guy named Kobe Bryant. But nonetheless, there always seems to be lots of drama when it comes to the Lakers and Clippers, and we'll bring you all of it right here on Playing the Field. Well, this has not been an easy season for the Los Angeles Dodgers. In fact, they've had to navigate through some very rough stretches. I had a chance to sit down with Dodger third baseman Justin Turner, who talks about how the team has come through some difficult days. You guys are in first place, but there has been such an influx of injuries, of people coming and going. Take us behind the curtain a little bit. What goes on in the locker room, and how do you guys feel like you've been winning and been able to continue winning? Yeah, well, it started early with us this year. You know, we, we had Brett go down in spring training, Andre go down in spring training. Uh, McCarthy was still rehabbing, coming back. So uh, we, I don't think you ever get used to it, but we, we were kind of dealing with it from, from day one, it felt like. So uh, as the season's progressed on and more and more guys have unfortunately gotten hurt, uh, it's kind of just roll with the punches and, and keep moving forward. And, and uh, uh, I... I always try to tip my hat to the front office for the job that they've done in creating depth on our roster and being able to plug those holes. When guys go down, more guys come up and step into that role, and, and they've been uh, doing a tremendous job for us, and I think that's how we've kind of been staying afloat. What is that like for you as a player? You've been one of the ones that has been here more stable, but when you've got guys like I talked to Will Venable, I've talked to guys that are sort of coming in and out, what is that like for you being in that locker room, trying to, to still have that camaraderie with everyone? Yeah, every, every time a new guy comes in, you, you just try to make them feel as comfortable as possible and make them feel like a part of the team, like they've been here for years. And uh, that's the whole goal. We want everyone to feel comfortable and feel like they belong here and to give them the best chance to go out and, and perform the way that, that we want them to perform and, and have success. Because we know if they're comfortable and they're playing good and they're having success, uh, it's going to give us the best chance to win. And when we come back, it's all about Dodger Japanese pitcher Kenta Maeda. Don't go away. All right, we are joined today by Kenta Maeda and Will Ireton, who you actually translate for Kenta. My first question is, how long have you known each other and how did you two meet? Well, you know, we, uh, we met at the beginning of the year. Uh, I was introduced by, uh, you know, mutual, mutual friends that we know. And uh, you become friends over time, yes? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a... Uh, Great friend. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see that you spend so, a lot of time working yeah, out with Kenta. Yeah, so you keep him in good shape. So, you know, you keep him in good You keep him in good shape. So, you know, you keep him in good shape. So, you know, you my rival now. Oh, yeah. oh, very good, very good. So, when you first came to the Dodgers, Kenta, how did you communicate with other players, even some of the Spanish players? Have you learned Spanish, learned English? How does that work? Well, do you know how to communicate? You know, the, uh, my teammates uh, told me how to, uh, you know, uh, they taught me certain uh, phrases, simple words that I can use, you okay. know, and uh, to players who can only speak Spanish, uh, that's, that's what I, you know, asked too, uh, just some certain words that maybe I can use. 
Okay. Yeah. When I watch you, I notice you in the dugout on the days that you're not pitching. I, and even for many pitchers, I watch you watching other pitchers on the mound. What do you look for when you're watching another pitcher? You know, if I'm uh, planned to pitch uh, during, during the series, mm -hmm. I do, you know, watch the hitters and see how they hit, what kind of swing they have. And even if I'm not going to be pitching that series, I, you know, I just look, just, um, you know, I'm there to root for my teammates. I noticed that uh, hitting is very important to the pitchers here at the Dodgers, and you've done very well hitting as well. Is that, is that fun for you to hit? Yeah, I love to hit. Um, you know, it's something that I've always prided myself in Japan too, and something that uh, you know I really enjoy, especially in a game-like situation. Uh, Takashi Saito mentioned to me that he said Rick Honeycutt was one of the best pitching coaches he ever worked with. What kind of adjustments makes him so good? You know, if there's something wrong with you know how I'm pitching, or if I'm if I'm in a little bit of a trouble. Um, you know, he gives me advices, so in that way he helps me out, up, you know, a lot. Um, and I'm sure, you know, since he has a lot of experience dealing with Japanese players, you know, a lot of his advices are probably coming from his experiences. Does he speak Japanese very well? Uh, not, not really, I don't think so. <laughs> you have to help him along a little bit. Yes. <laughs> what about Clayton Kershaw or some of the other pitchers? How, how do you talk to them? Through the interpreter or? You know, sometimes the interpreter is there to, uh, you know, interpret, uh, but um, you know, other times the players really speak in very simple language, so it helps me and I try to really listen hard and learn from what they're, you know, what they're saying. Well, this year's IndyCar season came to an end in Sonoma with Penske driver Simon Pagano winning the championship. Before another driver, James Henchcliffe, he decided he simply wasn't done competing. So he decided to follow in the footsteps of IndyCar driver Elio Castroneves. That's right. He joined the cast of Dancing with the Stars, and he's doing pretty well. I sat down with James in Sonoma, who talked about his journey from racetrack to dance floor. Very different kind of nerves, but uh, in a lot of ways more nervous. I've been racing 20 years, so I, I have a fair amount of experience. I have, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been through pretty much everything that could happen uh, on a racetrack at one point or another. I hadn't been through anything on a dance floor, good, bad, or indifferent. And so there was uh, a lot of unknowns, certainly, in doing it in front of not only a live studio audience, but the live television audience. Um, something I've been doing two weeks versus something I've been doing for two decades. It's uh, it's a different feeling. It is. It was very nerve wracking, but uh, I have an incredible partner in uh, in, in Sharna Burgess, and she uh, she kept me calm. We were joking literally right up until the the count came down. That we almost missed the start of the song because we were cracking jokes on the dance floor. Um, we didn't. I didn't even see the video package leading into it. We were. I, I don't remember what we were joking about. But we were joking about something, and I honestly don't remember much of the dance at all. I just remember ending and thinking, hey, that, that actually went pretty well. And floored by the, the scores and the judges' comments. I mean, it uh, couldn't have gotten any better. Problem is, it set the bar high, and now people expect good dances, but I'm not sure if we can actually repeat that. So have you ever danced before, and did Elio give you any pointers about being on the show? I have. I had never danced in any in any appropriate way before. Um, <laughs> now, uh, I, uh, I have never. I had never danced in any uh, sober way before. Maybe is probably the best way to put it. Um, I imagine the not so sober ways were not pretty. Um, so it, it was. Yeah. I mean, I was. I was a complete neophyte going into this. I had no. I mean, before the show, I had no desire to learn how to dance. It was just not even on my radar. Um, I've now, I can now say I've, you know, kind of learned to enjoy it quite a bit. And, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's cool learning something new. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the expectations going in were quite low. But I did get some pointers from Elio. Um, okay. Not so much on particular dances as much as just kind of learning a bit about the process and what I was subjecting myself to and, you know, how to, uh, how to get through it week to week. 
and James is doing very well. He's still in contention for that mirror ball trophy, so don't forget to tune in. And remember, don't forget to vote. Now, this year's IndyCar season had one of the closest race finishes in IndyCar history. It was at the Texas Motor Speedway between Graham Rahal and James Hinchcliffe. Here's my exclusive interview with Graham Rahal, who talks about what it was like to be at the finish line. You know, I told somebody the other day, and you know, perhaps I can't comment on this too much, but uh, I said to somebody, you know, it's probably the adrenaline and, and the feel of being in that car and being in that moment it's surreal you know it's the best high I think you could ever have but then you get out of the car and you, and you look back at what you just did and you think to yourself you know what and you know what am I thinking you know why why would we do that you know but in the moment you know battling wheel to wheel with these guys it's a lot of fun and you know what I'm very my you know I'm just very fortunate that that, that day worked out the way it did I mean at one point everybody was four wide the last two laps yeah. did you know you were James in that last lap when you were at the start finish line. Yeah, I knew I was ahead of them, and I, I uh, you know, with IndyCar and, and some of the technology they have, like the LED light panels on the side of the roll hoops, I knew I was ahead because I saw his number. Uh, yeah, it was close, but I mean, eight, eight thousandths of a second, that number sounds really close, but I say it was like two feet, which is, that's enough, you know, that's all we need. Well, that is all you need, I gotta tell you, I couldn't breathe the last lap just watching it on television, I'm like, this is nuts. Good fun, yeah. good fun, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just worked the high line those last couple laps. I was trying to get Hinge to open up the bottom, and I figured if I kept working the high line, he was going to think that's where I wanted to be. When the truth was, I wanted the bottom the whole time. I just needed him to move, and he left a hole open, and off I went. You know, so it, it, it worked out. I mean, I couldn't. You know, I look. It was one of those days. It was just very. Some days things go your way, and we were up front all night. We battled hard all night. But, uh, but it was one of those days where things, things just worked out. Well, this was a difficult season for our Los Angeles Angels, but we had a chance to sit down and meet many of the players, one of them being new catcher Jet Bandy. Let's take a look. Tell me a little bit about coming up in mid-season and kind of making this your own as a catcher. Uh, you know, I, uh, I got the call and I just wanted to you know, I just wanted to come up and do the best that I can and not try to do too much. And, you know, it's always been my goal to play in the big leagues. And, you know, you only get so many opportunities sometimes in this in your lifetime. And, you know, I just try to make the best of mine. You know, it seems like a lot of guys come up and they're kind of quiet and they, they don't want to make a bunch of noise. But, like, you, I know that you put pictures in your locker of the players. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, it's on my locker on the front. I just... Uh, I found a couple of baseball cards of you know my teammates, and I just started putting them on my locker. You know, if you're at like, you know, work or you have a desk or something, you hang pictures up like that. So uh, I put a couple up on there, and then uh, I just start, kept growing and growing and growing. And I pretty much almost have everybody on the team, including coaches. So it's pretty cool to see like their young, you know, minor league cards or like how they looked when they played. It's, it's pretty funny. Did you find the pictures of the coaches? Uh, I just uh, I just asked them. I'm like, hey, you know, you, you guys got a you guys got a baseball card I can have. And for all of our Oakland Raider fans here still in Los Angeles, we've got some news for you. You may have heard that the Raiders are looking into going to Las Vegas, but they may also come back to Los Angeles. We don't know yet. All we know is they're playing in Oakland, and I was up there as they took on the Atlanta Falcons. And here's what they had to say after the game. We scored late, and that just shows you um, we have to continue to believe, and you know we can't come out as flat as we did and just jump on them from the jump. What's it like having so many different people getting the ball too? Because it seems like w there's a lot more involvement. Uh, everybody, you know, you're from your tight ends, your running backs, you got four running backs, you got the wideouts. That just shows you how special we could be, man, if we put it all together on one day. And on our next show, we will catch up with our Los Angeles Rams to find out how they're settling in back here in Southern California. We're going to go to their training facility, which is out in Thousand Oaks, so you won't want to miss that. 
Well, this was the final season for Dodger broadcaster Vin Scully. After 67 years of calling Dodger games, he decided to retire. But he was much more than just a broadcaster to all the people that knew him. And they couldn't wait to tell me stories about Vin. Well, actually, in spring training in 1956, I was seven, and I, and I got to be a bat boy that day. It's an old story about Dad being a gray on bus driver, and, and uh, I remember being on the bench and batting practice, and, and I remember seeing this kind of a handsome, preppy-looking, red-headed man, and had no idea who he was, and, and then uh, come to find out the next time I bat boy, this was one of the announcers, you know, and I was really more impressed by how he dressed than anything else. He, he set the example for me over the years. <laughs> I was very preppy. But, uh, but then his voice was very distinctive. And then 1971, I come up and a, a wild arm third baseman on a day like today and middle of the game, and I throw a ball away. I'd had troubles. And back then with transistor radios, you could hear Vin's voice. And, and he said something in the effect of, well, the kid's throwing another away, but he's been working hard. And I think he's going to make it. And I, I thought, gosh. Mr. Scully said he thinks, okay, let's get back. Yeah, and he was, uh, he was inspirational, as he has been ever since. But just, again, his voice is just one of those voices that you can't get out of your head once he starts talking. And then I think the biggest memory is that he's up there by himself, and I'm not used to that. I can't sit there and talk about baseball by myself. i got to ask questions and try to bounce things off of people. He's bouncing them off himself, and that's kind of that's tough. Well, you know, he's the best when it comes to broadcasting a baseball game. Um, um, his articulation, he, he was the first one to coin the phrase, um, uh, the mouse that roared. Um, Moy, little Moy Wills, uh, darling of the Dodgers. Uh, he would, he'd come up with all those kind of things, um, to describe me. And, uh, I would, I would hear from friends. And, um. He's just as great today as he was back in those days. Yeah, so I grew up watching Vin, and um, I grew up in Torrance, uh, California, so Vin was uh, always on the radio for us, and um, my favorite memory is hearing him say my name when I came. So that, that was it, and, um, and other than that, you know, Kirk Gibson's obviously memorable for everybody, but listening to him call that game was pretty special. Oh, you're right a lot. Kirk Gibson hit that home run, I think, is probably one of my first ones. But then coming here and just realizing how nice of a man he is and uh, how genuine and how, uh, how respectful he is of uh, all the guys who walk through the clubhouse, I think, is something special. My first memories of Vin Scully, you know, I was a kid. I grew up in, in Orange County, so I grew up listening to Vin. Um, and it, the, for me, it's just amazing that he didn't have anybody else in the booth. Like, he did it all on his own. And the fact that he can still do that is just incredible. He's by far... Um, in my opinion, the greatest of all time ever. In any sport, he's the greatest sportscaster of all time. When you played here, did you hear from other people things he said about you? Uh, yes, I would hear things, stories. Yeah, of course, my dad would tell me, you got hey, you got to rewind the game and listen to what he said. Definitely. Um, it just amazing stories, and it's incredible, and he's, it's seamless. It's like he goes right into the next thing. He's just, he's, he's, a, he's a genius. He really is. Absolutely. And we will miss you very much, my friend. But I guess after 67 years of working, you and Sandy deserve a couple summer vacations. And that will do it for us on Playing the Field. Remember, you can watch Playing the Field 24-7 at playingthefieldtv.com. I'm Maria Sorreo, and I'll see you next time.